Uh, thanks. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that's been going on at Galois for about um, the last two and a half years, uh, which is Ivory. So what is Ivory? Well, um, it's a safe C language that's implemented as a, a staged EDSL in Haskell. Um, and so what do I mean by staged? Well, you know, we, we write these programs in Haskell, then we generate C and we compile that, and ultimately we run that on, on our actual target platform. Um, so the motivation for this uh, was actually uh, a project that started, I guess, about three years ago, um, which was uh, that we were going to be implementing the autopilot for a small sort of um, uh, quadcopter. And so uh, throughout doing this work, we, we kind of wanted to improve the confidence that we had in the software that we were writing. Uh, so we didn't want to just you know, write the whole thing in C, uh, perhaps not do any analysis on it and just end up with, with something flying this quadcopter. We wanted to know more like uh, we, we you know, didn't have any uh, memory leaks or, or, or uh, you know, buffer overflow possibility in there. Um, additionally, because of the way that we were going to implement this autopilot, uh, we were going to take an existing open source autopilot, the RGPilot project, and sort of remove chunks at a time, replacing them with, with code that we had implemented. Uh, we wanted to, to make sure that we had good interoperability with existing software projects. Um, additionally, we, we really wanted to be able to target multiple different platforms. So say, at some point our, our target platform changed, maybe we'd want to be able to target a different embedded platform instead of uh, just this specific uh, Cortex-M4. Um, additionally, we wanted to be able to do testing in a POSIX environment, so we, you know, we had lots of different, uh, different targets in mind with this language. Um, so throughout the design of the language, we, we kept in mind uh, Gerard Holtzman's uh, powers, uh, Power of Ten uh, rules for developing safety critical code. And so what these rules do is, is basically set forth uh, 10 guidelines that you can use to both uh, make your code a little bit more amenable to static analysis uh, and also just uh, kind of force you to think about things in a way that will cause you not to produce headaches down the line. Um, so in thinking about these, these rules while designing the language, we came up with um, about six rules that we thought that we could mechanize. Um, so things like uh, never allowing for uh, dynamic upper bounds on loops or not allowing dynamic memory use after initialization of the program. Um, and so we, we were able to, to implement these rules as either static checks in the Haskell type system or uh, by implementing passes over the resulting AST that we produce uh, at the end. Uh, and so you might be wondering, why an EDSL? You know, why not just implement a, a different static analysis pass over existing C? Uh, why not implement a full compiler? Um, and so a number of reasons. Uh, the first was that we were really interested to see how far we could push GHC. Uh, so specifically, uh, we were interested in using the, the new um, type-level natural numbers that were uh, implemented by Yavor and supported by the data kinds extension. Um, but also, we, we had a lot of experience in the past at Galois implementing EDSLs in Haskell. And we knew that we could be really productive uh, in this environment, um, and specifically that we could uh, have fast turnaround for, say, new language features as the DSL evolved. Um, and so, true to form, it took about six engineer months total to get the compiler to a state where we could do serious development with it. Um, so why don't we just take a, a look just dive right in, have a, have a look at some Ivory code. Uh, so what we have here is uh, the Ivory code on the left and the generated C on the right. Um, and you might notice immediately that there's a really close correspondence between the two, and that was actually intentional. We didn't really want to hide the fact that you were writing C here. Um, you know, we're, we're not worried too much about that fact, um, but we, we did want to make it uh, sort of familiar for, for this environment, specifically uh, embedded programming. Um, so what you see at the top uh, of both uh, let's see. Uh, so you see that the, the Ivory program consists of really two parts. Um, this structure declaration, which is uh, the sort of thing that you might see if you're implementing a, a parser for a protocol. So it's a, a message structure that contains uh, two fields, one tag, which is a, a uint8, and uh, an array of 10 additional uint8s. Um, and so this is just saying, you know, maybe you'll receive this message. It has this tag and this actual data associated with it. Um, the second part of, of the Ivory program is this sum bytes procedure. Um, and so as you can see, uh, the, the procedure basically will just accept a reference to one of these structures, uh, sum up all of the bytes in the message, and return that. Um, so let's, let's have a 
sort of a deeper look at, at this uh, structure declaration. So as you can see, there's a pretty close correspondence with the C that's generated, but the types in the ivory structure declaration look a little funny. Um, specifically, they have uh, for the tag constructor, for example, um, this stored uh, additional type constructor. And so the reason for that is that things, things that show up in structure declarations are in ivory uh, kinded as not star kinded things, but area kinded things. So in ivory, area is the kind of, of uh, allocated memory. It's how we type that, that region of memory. So stored in this case is the way that you, you take a star kinded thing and lift it into an area kinded thing. Um, additionally, the, the bytes field is uh, typed as an array of 10 stored UNAs. So, uh, array is actually another kind of, of uh, area type, which takes the number of things that will be uh, stored in that, in that uh, area, and then the area type of all of the elements of that array. Um, uh, so next, uh, inside of the sum bytes function, we locally will allocate a little reference to, to sort of um, hold our accumulated value while, while summing up the, the content of this array. And so allocation at, at, in, the, in a function is done with uh, the local primitive in ivory. Uh, so local uh, accepts a initializer for the area that it's going to be uh, allocating um, and then returns back to you a reference uh, that you can use. So as you can see here uh, on the left hand side that corresponds just to a use of local but in the C what that does is to allocate on the stack um, some space to hold that thing, and then also a pointer to it. Um, uh, additionally, in this case, we're using the I0 initializer because the thing that we're allocating a reference to, uh, being just a single byte, is actually uh, easy, well, safely zero initializable. Uh, so uh, then we get down to the meat of the sum bytes function. Uh, so what it does is uses the, the ivory primitive array map. Um, to construct a loop which will iterate through all 10 elements of the array, um, summing them up and, and sort of storing them in the, the intermediate accumulator. So array map probably looks a little bit funny because it only takes a single argument, which is a function that gives you an index. And the reason for this is that array map actually, um, it sort of calls this function for each index in the array, if, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and so you can see over in the, in the C side, what you end up with is just a for loop that increments through all of those indexes uh, and uh, indeed just the same as, as in the ivory on the left hand side, um, sums the element uh, with the accumulator and continues. Um, so now uh, stepping back a little bit, um, some other features of, of ivory are uh, the way that it does memory management. Um, so as I said early on, one of the, one of the, the rules from the power of 10 was uh, that you don't allow for dynamic allocation um, uh, after initialization. And so uh, the way that we enforce this in Ivory is just to never allow it at all. <laughs> and so uh, we, we do all of our allocation during program uh, execution on the stack, uh, which is convenient for us because, you know, mostly targeting the embedded platform, we, we kind of don't want to include a garbage collector. It's convenient for us to just use the C stack for doing, uh, you know, kind of garbage collection instead. Um, additionally, we implement a sort of a simple region system, which corresponds roughly to the current function frame or the, uh, the, the global uh, uh, region. Um, and so to see that in action, um, here's an example where we try and create a dangling pointer. So this uses the same structure as before, the, the message structure that has a, a tag and a byte array. Um, but this bad idea procedure is just going to try and locally allocate one of the, uh, well, allocate a reference to one of these things and then return it. Um, so the memory allocated would live on the stack. So returning this and then having something else use that pointer would mean it's now referencing memory that's sort of uh, out of scope and, and invalid. Um, so indeed, when we, when we try and compile this example, we get this, this error here, which is saying that this, this reference with um, region type stack s and area type struct message uh, could, well, you know, what would have caused this uh, variable s to escape its, its uh, declaring context, or its uh, declared context. And the reason for that is that we're using this, uh, this body combinator. So I think that showed up, well, it, it did show up in the previous example. But what body means is when defining a procedure, I've, I've sort of reached the point where I'm going to define the code of the procedure. 
Um, so I've, I've specified all my formal parameters and pre and post conditions. Uh, and now I'm just going to specify code. And so that body combinator also introduces locally uh, a type variable that represents the current region. Um, and because that type variable is uh, quantified in a rank two context, should it escape on the return type of the function, you end up with a, a type error. Um, so our region system, uh, as, I, as I suggested, is actually quite simplistic. Uh, and there's, there are a few cases where it, it uh, kind of falls down a bit, so I thought I might describe one of those. So imagine that you have this function, choose ref. Uh, so what it'll do is uh, accept a single Boolean and two references, and then based on the value of that Boolean, it will return one or the other. So as long as those two references come from the same region, there's no problem with this, and we can just return one or the other. But um, so what if, we, what if we decide to change that and now update, update one of them to be uh, S prime instead? Um, well, when we load this, the, the return type is actually going to be uh, something that I, you know, I don't really know how to think about what it will be at the moment because uh, it's going to have to choose at runtime um, the, the sort of uh, the type of the region. So we don't actually have anything at the moment to, to say that, that the region of this return type would actually be sort of the shortest lived region of the two, um, you know, kind of casting the longer lived one to the shorter region. Um, but uh, as you can see, you get a rather heinous type error as a result that's actually really difficult to decipher. And so I was thinking that perhaps Leonard's uh, suggested extension from yesterday might be really applicable here. Um, another thing that's quite common in Ivory is to, uh, to, to implement macros as just Haskell functions. Um, so I, I haven't shown this directly yet, but all of the statements with effects in Ivory uh, take place inside of the, uh, the Ivory monad. Um, and this monad has uh, an additional type parameter, which is this EFF type parameter. So you can see on the result of this, this macro with bytes, um, the result type is Ivory of F unit. Um, and so this, this, uh, this F parameter represents the, um, the, the effect context. Uh, and the effects that we can deal with at the moment are uh, allocation and some control effects, specifically uh, returning and whether or not it's acceptable to break out of a loop. Um, so if you happen to notice that the effect context is actually different uh, on the function that's passed into this macro, um, the reason for that is that uh, up here in the context, uh, this second effect is declared as being the first one but with its allocation effects removed. Um, so what that means is that this, this function passed in, uh, when run in this context, will not be allowed to allocate, and that's checked uh, statically. Um, so this shows up in, in two places uh, in this function. There's the, the equality constraint where we define uh, the new effect context by using clear alloc. And there's also, uh, in, in the actual code, a use of this no alloc combinator. Um, and what no alloc does is sort of adapts this, this context that's not allowed to allocate to one that now could allocate or could also not allocate. So the, the purpose is just to make it run now uh, again in that context. So uh, this duplication isn't, I think, really ideal. You know, it'd be nice if you could just specify manipulations to the, the effect context in one place. Um, and indeed, using partial type signatures, you can actually get that sort of, uh, that sort of behavior. Um, so what you can do is uh, instead, you know, put an underscore in the position where you would have the effect context of, of the computation that you're accepting, um, and then just use the no alloc combinator uh, inside of the code. Um, and so while this is nice and it does work, and as you can see, GHC will infer the correct thing um, for, for the context of, of, the, uh, of, the comp of the computation that you're passing in, uh, you kind of lose out on the documentation that you get in the previous version. So here you can see in the type that this is definitely a new effect context that is the old one minus allocation. Here you just know that you know, you're, you're doing something else in that context. And, and the fact that it's, it's uh, the, old, the old context without allocation is kind of lost because it's, it's only really visible um, in the actual code. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about how Ivory has worked out for us in practice. Um, so we've, we've been working on the SMAC compilate uh, project for, um, I, gu I guess, around three years now. And we've amassed around 200,000 lines of Ivory code. 
Um, so this has ended up being a very well exercised DSL um, and, and has caught uh, a lot of bugs. Uh, additionally, we've had some, some pretty good uh, uptake with our industry partners. Uh, so Boeing has implemented their uh, Stanag 4586 um, layer using Ivory. Uh, and Stanag 4586, in case you're wondering, is a data link and command and control standard. Um, so they, they implemented this uh, for use with their unmanned Little Bird project, which is a sort of uh, real person-sized helicopter that's flown by, uh, by an autopilot. Um, so just to summarize, and this is a, a point that I didn't really stress very much uh, throughout the talk, but recompilation can be uh, something that takes quite a lot of time with, with Ivory programs um, because you will you know, go through the Haskell compilation phase, you'll run the program to produce the C, you'll compile the C, you'll load it uh, to the, the thing that you're debugging, and then you'll start it back up and get the debugger to the point where you were, you were uh, actually working. Um, and despite the fact that this actually takes quite a while, it hasn't uh, ended up being all that much of a problem for us because we catch a fair amount of bugs when actually writing the code in the first place. Um, so we, we uh, yes, I think, I think we've gotten a lot of utility out of that. Um, and to answer the first question that I had at the beginning of the talk, um, I think that, that we've shown that GHC plus the extensions that we're using actually provide excellent support for implementing uh, a safe C language uh, as, as an EDSL. Um, additionally, we, there, there's a lot of, of uh, work that I've left out of this talk. Uh, we produced uh, a large number of additional tools for use with Ivory, uh, and there are uh, a whole host of additional language features that I I haven't meant to talk about, or that I uh, haven't managed to talk about. Um, so please read the paper uh, to find out more about that. Uh, anyway, thank you. I'm wondering if you can give a sense of what kind of bugs uh, you managed to catch uh, with the additional expressiveness of the type system, and also um, whether you have a sense of what Boeing's um, reaction or, or experience with Ivory was. Ah, okay. Yeah, so the sorts of bugs that we normally catch are things like um, where, where you would iterate past the end of an array or that sort of thing. It's, it, it's usually just memory safety bugs that we're catching at this level. Um, we do have the ability to express uh, pre and post conditions, which is something that I hadn't really talked about. Um, and to make use of that, we actually have uh, uh, integration for CBMC. And so we can emit ivory code that's usable with those tools to discover additional bugs. Um, and then in terms of use by Boeing, um, they initially were not all that excited about writing Haskell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> perhaps a big surprise. Uh, but uh, Lee actually implemented a concrete syntax for ivory, which, uh, so you can use that to define functions inside of the ivory quasi quoter in addition to structures and other things. And they've mostly been using that, though I heard recently that they have been transitioning over to just implementing everything directly in Haskell because they've decided that, uh, I'm assuming that the expressiveness of, of uh, the concrete language isn't what they'd like. So can you call uh, external C functions, like things that are very low level or that have been implemented you know, actually externally in C? F FFI, if you like, yes, library indeed. into C. Yes, indeed you can. And so that, that was, uh, I was tr trying to speak a little bit to that uh, in the beginning oh, when sorry. talking about in interoperability. Uh, so, so the way that we were initially working was to just replace uh, modules, essentially, from ArduPilot with, with Ivory generated C. And so we were doing that by hooking into the, the parts that we needed to by, by using the, um, the FFI. I mean, we have just sort of a way of importing symbols to, to use them in Ivory. So obviously we lose our guarantees of memory safety when, when working with that code, but it's, it's been enough for us to just, you know, kind of slowly replace that code. So uh, you, you presumably declare, like, the, the type yes. of the external? Yes. Um, so, so everywhere that you saw, um, let's see. So where you saw a, a use of proc um, for defining a, a, a procedure directly in Haskell, you could also just choose to say instead, import proc and give a symbol name and a header and uh, define a type signature for it that, that would end up uh, kind of defining the calling convention for the, nice. the C function. Uh, so I have a question about, uh, about the proc function uh -huh. because it seems to take a string argument which I understand is turned into a name of the C function. Yes. And my question is uh, if I want later to call a function 
from one function from another, do I still have to supply a string? I mean, uh, that seems ah, like no. a very error problem. Yeah, so that, that was something that I also sort of left out, but you can see it a little bit in, um, in, in this example. So there's the call function that accepts then that definition from, from the earlier example. Uh, and so that uses a type class then to decide how many arguments it's going to need uh, so that we, we, you know, we get a well-typed call. So you're, you start off by saying you wanted to see how far you could push sophisticated type systems and GHC in particular. Yes. Where, where did the shoe then start to pinch? Usually when these things happen, you find, actually, there are some things that I really want to do, I just couldn't. Yeah. Or also when you're doing an embedded DSL, you often find there are some places where everything's working smoothly and then there's something that's really awkward. So where, where does the shoe pinch for you? Um, so I think that, that there were a couple areas for us. The first was that the, uh, the solver for the type NATs is still uh, you know, not quite there. We'd, we'd like to write a, a ray slicing operations and things like that. Right. So just, just um, beat on Ivo, a Yavo, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Yavo is good. Yeah, it's all his fault, yeah. Um, but uh, additionally, we, we had trouble. So one thing I didn't talk about in this talk is the module system of Ivory, which is something that you build up manually as a value. And so the reason that we did this was to support sort of separate compilation in the sense that we'd produce a lot of different C modules. Um, and we had a tremendous amount of trouble with this. Uh, and so I think that what we really wanted was a way to uh, observe declarations. And I, I don't really know what, you know, how, how that would end up uh, looking other than, say, writing all of your code inside of a, a quasi-quoter and then having it emit both this, this module specification and the, the symbols at the same time. But, um. Okay, thanks. So you mentioned compile time being a problem. Is, is there a reason that this is necessarily whole program at the point that it goes to the C compiler? Or could you, in principle, cache maybe at the granularity of function definition, definitions? Like in Accelerate, we cache at the CUDA kernel level. Yeah, so, so we do actually, um, at least at the moment, we don't compile the whole program at once. Uh, you can compile, say, an individual module at once. So you could have one, one Haskell program that corresponded to the production of one C module. Um, and so in that sense, you could get a, you know, a bit better compile time because you wouldn't be recompiling everything when you made a single change. But, but the way that it's kind of worked out is that oftentimes you end up recompiling everything because you change something low down in a library dependency somewhere and it just kind of propagates back up and, and all of a sudden you rebuild the whole thing. Thank you. Okay. Hey, that's